Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Hello, 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 hello. An old hello. Three Got a little old Three Stooges uh, play right there. So, hello, everybody. We missed last week because I had too much family junkola going on last week to be able to run the game. Wah. So, um, I do know that we will have one player who is going to be connecting with us a little late this morning. He uh, let me know two days ago that he was going to be late today. So, uh, that would be our uh, Aglius. Look at See, I can say his name today. Um, our Sferf Neblin wizard. He will be uh, a little bit late for us uh, today. So, why don't we go through the introductions, since it's been two weeks. We'll go through the introductions for the players and the characters, and then we'll do a recap of last game session, and go from there. So, why don't we start with Ariki. That would be you, Alex. Yes, yes, sorry. Um, multi-passive. Um. Uh, Ricky is still hiding. Uh, let's see. Ariki is um, an, uh, a sniper or a scout, um, and she doesn't talk very much. Um, she's um, yeah, she doesn't talk very much. She just likes to shoot things. As long as they shoot first. Okay. And who are you, player? Tell us a little bit about you. Me? I'm Alex, and um, I don't like to say very much. I might talk a lot, but I don't actually say very much. Um, yeah, that, that's, <laughs> that's about all I'm really to say. Gotcha. All right. So why don't we go with Blue Moon next? Hello, my name is Flower, and I'm playing a character named Blue Moon, which has some celestial heritage in her blood, but she is not totally aware of what she is. She knows that she is glowing during the night. That's why she has been called Blue Moon. She doesn't know her real name. They never gave her a, a name, I think, because she is not sure. She doesn't know about it, and she is a Simari. Very cool. And why don't you tell us a little about yourself? Me? I'm a D&D lover. I'm a huge fan of Critical Role and other D&D shows. That's awesome. here. Awesome. Very cool. Let's go with Bowden. Hi, I'm, I'm Zoo, a longtime D&D player and uh, DM. I will be playing Bowden, who is a half-orc of humble beginnings, who followed a path to becoming a paladin to protect the weak, and uh, eventually gained favor from a celestial entity and uh, gained a couple levels of warlock as well. Very cool. And last and certainly not least, Seraphin. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Sherry Fate. I'm playing Seraphin, which is a uh, tiefling Eldritch Knight um, who's just basically here to get her money and shake down some people. Uh, I've been playing D&D &D off and on for the last decade or so. And of course, you know, I like to play other systems. I'll basically play anything that has dice and I can kill anything. So awesome. Very cool. And it sounds like you got yourself a new microphone and headset. Uh no, I just mess a lot with the, the connection, so hopefully it's it's better. <laughs> it is clear as a bell, like you're sitting next to me. Which I'm not, because that would be creepy. That would be a little creepy, I will admit. That would be a little bit creepy. So, um, who would like to volunteer what we did last time? Um, I can do that as soon as I pull up my log from last week. 
Um, okay, let's see. Last week we um, we started uh, having just finished a battle with a group of uh, brigands. We managed, which we had managed to defeat, mostly by running them off. Although we did kill quite a few of them. Um, we met up with uh, our Azamar Blue Moon and our Tiefling Seraphim, who are who were seeking Lothar the Shiv, um, who had stole from them and cheated them and whatnot. We, on the other hand, were after Lothar because he has some information about this disappearing mountain full of dragon loot that we were uh, interested in going uh, going after. So we. Uh, took the night to rest and uh, uh, recover and um, headed for uh, the town where we were told Lothar would be found. Um, we uh, attempted to create a distraction by setting loose the um, remaining horses from the brigands, but apparently that did not work very well. Um, we um, Several of us, of us observed um, outside the inn, uh, looking for, trying to see if we could locate Lothar um, on his way in, while others of us stayed warm inside. Those of us outside um, froze for a couple of hours and ended up going inside because we didn't want to die of frostbite. And um, Seraphin uh, stayed outside, apparently, and means cold and uh, wandered around town and located what she believes was Lothar's house. She comes back to get us and um, we find um, four of us investigate the cellar while um, Ariki remains outside uh, and watches. Um, and the cellar being um, quite uh, empty and irrelevant, uh, we came back into the house and um, just as we were starting to really explore the house and try and figure out our next move, we are challenged by uh, by uh, some uh, associates of Lothar's. Um, we sneak out the back door, debate silently amongst ourselves whether we're going to flee or fight, and we end up fighting and we defeat them quite handily with um, a few area of effect spells. We do manage to retain a um, captive, um, mostly because she appeared to be a uh, an unwilling participant in the battle. And, uh, and that is where we left off. Excellent. Wow. Very, very good. All right. So I gave you an additional point of inspiration. So you now have two points of inspiration. Uh, everybody else in the party has one point except for Seraphin, who has none. Um, I will allow you to give one other player a point of inspiration. Well, seeing as Seraphin has none. Um, perhaps she could use some. All right. So I'll give her a point of inspiration right there. All right. So that is where we currently are, is standing out in front of Lothar's house right after the battle. Blue Moon was able to, to do a little bit of curative magic on uh, this woman. And she's still unconscious at the moment, uh, considering that uh, Aglius had uh, fireballed her pretty darn well, and uh, some others had uh, taken a few swipes of uh, swords or axes or what have you at her. So this is where we are starting off, is she's laying on the ground, her wounds are, he are, are closed, um, she is now breathing normally. And what shall the five of you do? Well, four and a half of you, since the other one is not here yet. I'd like to inspect the cover and see if I can open it. Okay. It is a leather collar. Uh, looks very much like a like a dog collar would, except it is, has a lock on the back of it. 
Can I try to pick the lock? Yes, you can. If you have a thieves tool proficiency, by all means, you are welcome to go ahead. I and pick do. It. Very good. Very, very good. Uh, you deftly pick the lock. And you can see that it uh, falls off easily. Um, the lock was pretty good construction. And uh, something that um, she must be a very valued slave if she had something like this on her. I would pass it to our honorable mage and ask him to check if it's magical. Since he's not here right now, I will roll a Arcana check for him. Odin would like to uh, intercept that and uh, see if he can detect it as well. Okay. Uh, would you like to use a spell, or do you, would you rather use Arcana? Um, well, Bowden's, the symbol on Bowden's neck flares with a blue light, and his eyes shimmer blue for a moment. And uh, he uses his warlock trait to be able to, de to detect magic. Okay, very good. So you do that, and you see that she has no magical equipment on her, and the collar was not magical either. It's mundane. Yes, then that's a mystery why she was acting like that. If it was not magical, it was not forcing her to be on their side. These types of things are used to train animals, so it may be a behavior type control. Or maybe it was a reminder. Maybe she has something to lose. Um, let's see. Both Bowden and Blue Moon, the two of you, or one of you, I don't care whichever one, um, can roll a medicine check, uh, looking down at her. Um, one of you can roll it at advantage, since you basically have help from the other one. Um, and you're standing there looking can at I her. Can I do that? Yeah, well, you go for it. With advantage? Yep, with advantage. The skin beneath the collar that is now revealed um, shows that she has been wearing this collar for quite some time. Uh, it would be at least a few months, if not longer. It looks like somebody that needs our help. Bowden will kneel down to her and uh, lay his hands upon her and attempt to heal her. Okay. Uh, she is in the combat tracker. I moved her to uh, neutral at the moment since she's unconscious. Uh, so if you would like to utilize your like lay on hands or a spell, you can go ahead and target her and cast away. So once again, the symbol on his neck glows uh, a light blue briefly as uh, he invokes some healing. Okay. Well, that healing, I mean, it's only one point, but still, that healing uh, is enough that her eyes begin to flutter open. She looks a little scared looking up at the very strange ensembled cast above her. I mean, we have an Asmar, a half-orc, and a very gray gnome standing over her, looking down at her. I'd like to use my healing hands on her. Okay. I just don't remember how it worked, because it, because it doesn't have, like, a die to roll. Okay. Um... Let me look. So she gets like 
10 heal points. Okay, I'll give it back to her. With that, she 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 smiles at you and she reaches up to her neck because it, it's a little chilly out. I mean, as as we had uh, you know found out last time, it was beginning to snow. So uh, she reaches up and she touches her neck and she realizes that the the collar is gone. It's okay, dear. Don't worry. I removed it, and I want to like take my cloak and wrap it around her so she's not that cold. Okay, not a problem. She looks up at you and, and, and she kind of, her breath comes quickly suddenly, like she's scared or excited. And she goes, thank, thank you for sparing my life. I was not with these brigands of my own free will. I come from the same village as Arthur. And she kind of like lifts her head and looks around and, and points at the, at the large dead man that's over by Seraphin. A few years ago, he saved my life and, and in gratitude, my teacher pledged my services to him. Arthur was not always such a bad man, but he had fallen on hard times and came under the sway of that evil Lothar. Perhaps it's best that he's been sent to his rest. Save your praise. We are but ordinary heroes returning to you what you deserve, your freedom. Oh, thank you. Thank you so very much. Does Lothar have something to keep you a prisoner of him? Lothar is just an evil, evil man. He used my talents to to hurt people that wouldn't that wouldn't pay him what he wanted. But why 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 you had a collar? That was my collar of servitude. It Lothar put it on me. To remind me that I was his. Did he do something to you? She goes on to explain some of the atrocities that have been committed to her or have been done to her um, over the last, actually, you find out, years that she has been in servitude. Um, Arthur has always protected her, and even after Arthur began his downward spiral into to, uh, villainy, I guess is the best way of putting it, um, he still protected her from Lothar, from like physical harm, but the mental harm that was caused was horrible. Um, her teacher was threatened, who you find that she loved her teacher um, very much and and was really very. For an apprentice, she was she was connected to him. She cared for him a lot, but uh, Lothar promised to kill him if she ever betrayed him. So. She did pretty much anything Lothar wanted, including putting on this collar, which was more or less a symbol of the fact that Lothar dominated her. Okay, I want to take the collar in my hand and burn it. Okay. I'm going to assume you're going to utilize like a cantrip or something just to kind of like... Yeah. All right, so you pick up the collar and, and you look at her and you look at the collar and you burn it right there. And she she sheds a tear. Not You're not sure if she's shedding a tear out of sadness, memory, or, or happiness. You're not quite sure. But she sheds a single tear as she begins to stand up and, and dust herself off. She hands don't, you back your don't cloak. Don't cry. Don't cry. That that's in the past. That's why I destroyed it. You need no reminder of it. You're right. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. My life is indebted to you. Is there anything I can help you with? Well, we are looking for Lothar, and as I say that my eyes are like shining with the blue light. He has something of mine that I want back, and if you could help us in any way to catch him 
and pay him back for all his evil deeds, I'd be, I'd be grateful. He's a suspicious one, that. I know that he's left town. Arthur was pissed when he found out that Lothar had left without him. But I don't really know much other than that. Um, I could help you find him. I, I know what he looks like. Oh, do I ever know what he looks like. And I would be more than happy to to lend my, my magical aid to to help you find and defeat this terrible man. Did Arthur know where Lothar was going? Arthur... Arthur would have known more. And she looks over at his corpse that's that's laying on... Like, Don't by worry surface. about it. Tomorrow we can ask him. How, how are you supposed to do that? Well, you see, I'm a healer. I can't speak with dead people. Oh my. Yes, it sounds scary. I know I was scared the first time I tried it too. It's not quite so scary, it's just... A little... Well, I'm not a necromancer. I, I, I don't really deal with the dead often. So, it's just a little distasteful to disturb the dead. It is not disturbance. It's useful to know, and they cannot lie to me. We might be able to find out right now. And uh, Bowden walks over to Arthur, picks him up, picks up the corpse, and casts uh, Death Recall, so he can see the last 10 minutes of uh, the subject's life. Okay. Um, what you'll see is about at the at the most extent, okay, so at least 10 minutes ago, um, you see that Lothar, well, not Lothar, you see that Arthur is talking to a commoner of some kind who's telling him that Lothar his house is being broken into by a group of people. Uh, Arthur immediately charges, you know, all the people who are around him, charges them up and says, look, we have to go save Lothar. And you know, save his belongings and, and, and find out what these people want. And he has whispered almost inaudibly even to you in your in your death recall um he whispers that he wonders if this is the group that lothar was talking about and you hear him mention dragon mountain i will relay that information to the party uh where was this taking place uh in town uh, it looks like it was probably in a house. Um, you also see that Arthur goes from house to house, and he grabs a couple of people who are obviously loyal to Lothar and comes here. So essentially we've decimated this small village. Uh, a fair portion of it, yes. All right. Uh, might as well burn the whole village down then. Wow! So what about the women and children? Eh. <laughs> wow! What about that it's a severe, severe winter and they will all freeze to death? Yeah, they So then we're them. doing them a service, you know, instead of dying horrible deaths of starvation and cold, one quick blaze of glory. Nobody deserves that fate. Leave the farmers to their lands. Pretty much. Leave the farmers to the lands is actually probably a good thing. Just because the men are dead doesn't mean that the women can't take care of things. Exactly. Only because they have been dominated by an evil person, that doesn't mean they don't deserve some goodness. So as Bowden tells all of you what he's heard and seen through Lothar's eyes, uh, Arcana, which is the woman, uh, she says, I've, I've heard him speak of this Dragon Mountain 
and it's something he fears. He seems to know quite a bit about it, um, but he's always been very closed mouth, even to Arthur. The only way you'll be able to get any information out of him is to scare it out of him. He's a coward by nature. That's why he acts like such a bully. Unfortunately, I have no idea where he would have gone. So we have a means to make him tell the truth. One way or another. There, I'll flip her token so we all know that she's standing up, right, and everything. She uh, shivers for a moment and touches that blank spot on her neck again, like she, almost like she would absentmindedly fidget with the the collar, but uh, it just, yeah, it's not there anymore. Um, would there's an inn in town? Had, have any of you been there yet? Yes, we have reserved rooms. Uh, do you need us to get you a room too? You can stay with us. I, I, I can I can afford my own rooms. Um, but it would be much better to talk in a place that has some warmth than it would be to stand here in the dark and the cold. You're absolutely right. Let's head back to the inn. After I fleece the bodies, please. Uh, okay. Please share what you find. You will find a grand total of 250 gold pieces, and there is the uh, Arthur's greatsword is also in the uh, party sheet as well. So that is what you find. Can I hold the sword for less than a minute, a few seconds? You need sure. it for a few seconds? All right. Yeah, I, I, I'm putting my crossbow and my shield back and I'm just holding the sword. Does it produce flame? It does not. However, let me look at some of the information on your character sheet. Um, yep, it does not produce any flame. However, a Riki, even from where you're currently standing, you can see that there is lightly etched in the side of the blade runes of some kind, of some kind of magic. I just hold it with both hands, swing it around, look at it with amazement, and I'm not sure, some other feeling, and then I hand it over and say, it's a very nice weapon. Unfortunately, it's not my weapon. I'll take it along for now. We'll find some use for it, if not, just sell it off. Alrighty. And I'm going to I can always use it, maybe, someday. But it's good if it's being put to immediate use right now. All right, so I'm going to look at Bowden's character sheet for a minute while you guys start heading towards the uh, the inn. There's a whole bunch of, like, dead bodies in the front yard here, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, and snow is beginning to uh, pile up on them. Okay, I, I'll help you go through the bodies so it goes faster. Well, I was just going to put them in the little basement thing. For a storage shed. Are we hiding the bodies? What are we doing with the bodies? Hiding the bodies to not cause so much panic. Where would you like to hide the bodies? In the basement. In the, yeah, same idea in the basement. Okay. Well, Just start throwing them down there. Okay, well, <laughs> you will quickly fill the basement. After all, there was something, what was it? It was like 20. Uh, bodies. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you will quickly fill the basement uh, with bodies to the point where you have no more room to throw them in. Damn it. Just put them inside that house. Okay. No one's going to go inside, so the rest of the dead bodies can just lay there on the floor. Okay. 
Uh, Bowden, where is your scent of vengeance? Which, uh, what is that, a spell or is that a, uh, ability? Second level spell. Awesome, thank you. Because I have to think about this one for a second. Because she's not quite allied to you yet, even though the two of you have the same... You have the same goal, which is to see Lothar. However, I wouldn't call her an ally yet. Yeah, I figured it probably wouldn't apply, but I thought I'd ask. Yep. So, alrighty. So, you guys will head after throwing the bodies in the house, in the basement, cleaning up the area. The only thing of worth was a few of them had some gold on them. Um, and then, of course, there was Arthur's greatsword, which... Uh, Ariki has seen the runes etched down one side of the blade. Um, though I don't think Ariki would know. Let me look at her character sheet. Nope, Ariki would not know what those say. We had seen the sword uh, burst into flames, so... We yes. have an idea of what the enchantment is. Yes. Yes, you do. You have a very good idea of what that enchantment is. But that would probably be the activation word that is scrawled down the side of it. It may take some, some, uh, some magical knowledge to be able to figure out what the, uh, the word is. But... You will head back over to the Twin Forks Inn. Um, at the moment, as you walk through the door, or at, even before you walk through the door, you can hear the sounds of discordant music being played on a lute inside. Does it hurt my ears? Um, it wouldn't really hurt your ears so much as it's just not, it's not good. <laughs> it's just plainly not good music. Does it look like a person is trying, at least? Well, when you enter the building, you will see that there is a young man uh, of about an average build. Um who's wearing some kind of garish looking clothes uh in the picture i just shared he's the gentleman who's sitting on the stool uh in the really like fluffy sleeved coat um he's not really good at playing music uh he's playing and he's talk singing a poem uh, at the same time, and it's really not good at all. As Seraphin walks in, she'll walk straight over to him, grab the loot, and say, by the gods, please stop. Okay, now as you do that, from the doorway, you hear the door suddenly crash open behind all of you. And in this this strong, very male voice, you hear behind you, Halt, miscreant! Take back your ill deed, else we must stop you! Stop me from make or er, stop me from stopping horrible noise. You turn around to see a interesting looking group. Um, you see a fat older man, uh, probably in his late forties to mid fifties, dressed in heavy plate armor and has a gorgeous gorgeous looking sword strapped to the side of, of, of his belt 
he's pointing at you, Seraphin, and standing next to him, um, you see the, you actually see the person who's standing next to him in the picture. Uh, he's the man who's on the left-hand side with the, with the weird cap and the, like, hair sticking out. He's obviously a priest of some kind, uh, in his 60s. And behind these two is a half a dozen men dressed in heavy armor with weapons as well. They all bear a mark on their chest. Anybody who is religious in the party may give me a religion check if they wish. My game decides not to freeze. Oops. I crashed. I see that. <laughs> I was trying to close the picture and it didn't let me and then the game suddenly crashed. Well, when you reconnect, I will reshare the picture for you. It's okay. I'm not sure if I took religion. Let me take a look. I think you said you did not want it. Nope, you do not have religion. Okay. Then maybe a religious person can make the roll. Uh, yep, the religious person in the party did make the roll, and he did woefully poorly. So I'll describe it to you. <laughs> um, it the symbol looks like a hand that. Oh, excuse me, that's hold, held open, outstretched, and there's an eye in the center of it, um, which is wide and open, and I mean, it looks nice, I mean, it's it's not a, a horrible looking symbol or anything like that. Open hand with an eye in it? Yes. Would I have seen the symbol before? Um, you know what, you can still give me a religion if you would like. I would definitely like when my game loads. <laughs> okay, not a problem. But he stands there in the doorway, pointing at Seraphin, and the young man you just grabbed the loot from jumps up and stands in between Seraphin and this man and goes, Sir Oliver, my friend, no worries, no worries. This fine young woman right here, and he kind of waves his hand up and down Seraph, like pointing at Seraphin. This fine young lady was just about to regale us using my lute with her own songs. Please, lady, show us what you have. And go, Seraphin, go! Yeah, exactly. Burden chuckles and brings up a, a chair nearby. Do I recognize the symbol? I am going to whisper it to you right now. Okay. Oh, God. A performance <laughs> <laughs> on something I am so not even... Hold on. Not a problem. Not a problem. You know what? I never did pick that musical instrument. <laughs> no, no, you didn't. But right now... <laughs> oh, God. I will help you out. Don't worry. Are you proficient in a string instrument? No, but I'll give you guidance. Okay, that sounds pretty good. Let me just see how I'm supposed to do that. Let's see, it's an, what, it's an extra D4? Is that right? Or a D6? I can't remember. I think okay. it's a D4. Yeah, it's an extra D4. All right, so, yep, go ahead and roll your performance check. Roll an extra D4 if you wish to use it, and an extra D6. As okay. the young man places his hand on your shoulder... And kind of whispers things into your ears, like how to pick the lute strings and such. <laughs> okay. Also known as he's giving you bardic inspiration. Which is horrible since he was doing such a poor, poor job at it. Mm. I'm putting my arm like on Seraphim's other shoulder and go behind her and tell the bard, thank you for helping us out. Okay, so Seraphin begins to play, and she understands, by, I mean, you understand that Blue Moon and this young man are both helping you in some other way. 
and you play it, believe it or not, better than what he was. Surprising. Uh, damn. Okay. <laughs> the young man starts I clapping along. I told you, along. I believe in you. Yeah, the young man starts clapping along to you, and he and he looks over at the at the man who's in the who's walking in the door with all these other men, and he says, "Sir Ovulus, please have a seat and enjoy the music." As I said, this young lady was just helping me out. The 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 older man, as he strides across the room, Bowden, please roll me a perception check. And Ariki, I will give you a piece of information here in a moment. I can quickly look at Bolden and snap my fingers. He he gets guidance too. Ah, okay. So Seraph, okay. So uh, Bolden, uh, roll another D four, and we'll add it to that. Nice. All right. So I will whisper both of you a piece of information. There you go. So both of you have a piece of information now. Um, <clears throat> so Sir Ovulus and his retinue of people come over, sit down at a table not too terribly far away from where you guys are. And he yells back, says, Julius, are you sure you want this? And he points at, at, at Seraphin, woman, to use your instrument. The priest sitting next to him says, Julius, that woman plays it better than you have ever played. And then they go off and they start drinking and teeheeing and laughing to each other. I invite the bard to join us on a table with Arcana and to share a cup of drink with us. Okay. He will most definitely say yes to that and as he approaches the table he says hailing greeting adventurous people i trust you will enjoy my words more than you did obviously so my music uh you do have uh, uh some reputa reputation do you not even one so new to town is i have heard that you have asked about Lothar and that fabled Dragon Mountain. Well, we were hoping to write some evil deeds. Hmm. Well, I may know something that would be of interest to you. I am, you see, observant Please? in these unusual things. Well, I believe you are a font of knowledge and inspiration. Ha ha ha! Indeed I am. You can almost hear the ting off his perfectly white pearly teeth as he, as he smiles. Now, obviously he is much better at speaking than he ever was at playing an instrument. He should probably leave the instruments to someone who actually likes to play instruments. Um, and he should probably stick to poetry. So long as this is not a musical, I await your story. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Would you be so kind to tell us your name? I am Julius. Julius the Magnificent. And he does it. He stands up and he gives you a flourishing bow and a, and a tip of his cap. And he smiles at you. And he looks over at Bowden and he goes, Oh, my good man. Last night, I did indeed have an opportunity to see something that might be of relevance to your inquiry. Oh, and what was that? He smiles and looks across the tavern, and and you can see that he's looking at a woman who's obviously a barmaid, um, who's a little heavy in the chest, and uh, a little bit greater in proportion <laughs> in the rest of her body. 
Um, but she seems to be. Oh wow. Yeah, she's she's a she's a she's a very attractive. Not I wouldn't call her very attractive, but she's not common. She's a little bit above common. Um, she would be attractive to some people. Uh, she's obviously a hardworking, you know, country woman. She has the tan. She has the uh, she has the the dirty hair, you know, color. But she's basically a commoner, just soft. She's rounded. Her edge she doesn't have too many edges to her. Um, Do I see that? Oh yes, yes, yes. Now, I lean towards him. It's like if you tell us a story, I might help you out. Oh. Oh, I can do more than tell you a story. And he smiles. This woman, who, you know, as I said, is, is we would call her comely, I guess. Um, and very notable, because her hair is dark red. And falls in these natural curls, almost to her waist. Julius stands up and positions himself so that no one other than you can see what's about to be revealed. He calls her over, and as she gets to him, he kisses her. And as he's kissing her, he lifts the hem of her skirt up past I, mid-calf. When I was leaning to towards him, it was like my shoulder brushed over his shoulder, and I gave him inspiration. Ooh. Like guidance. And if guidance. he needs it. Okay. Yeah, just a slight touch of guidance. Okay. Well, the barmaid is absolutely enthralled by the attention that Julius is giving her and gives her, you know, the two of them give each other a, a, a very, very deep and um, energetic kiss. Um, everybody, please roll me a perception check. Ariki, you have advantage on this perception check. So everybody but Blue Moon, who probably was brushing against Julius at the time, uh, didn't really notice this, but Julius is doing this so he can point at the barmaid's leg, where you see that there is a tattoo. The tattoo is an intricate in illustration of a great red dragon curled around a craggy mountain peak. The detail, especially of the town at the foot of the mountain and the terrain nearby, is superb. This could only have been drawn specifically from a map. For another moment or so, Julius delays and, 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 and you know, talks and kisses the, the barmaid for a few more moments. And then finally releases the hem of her skirt and her from his own grasp. With a smile, he assures her of his devotion and his attempt to meet her later. And she returns the smile and turns, winks at all of you, and with a swirl of her skirt, returns back to work. At that point, Julius sits down, adjusts his tunic, and then he begins to talk to you. I was so taken by the detail of the work, I asked her last night where she got that tattoo. It seems that there's a particularly low tattooist in this town, a man named Jade Rubino, and he has a shop on the far side, just outside the outskirts of town. I tried to talk to him this morning, but he must have just awakened and was rather impolite. I did, I did note his shop was full of other men who also appeared to be short of sleep. Now. What do you make of this? That they have been busy the whole night? He uh, kind of leans forward, can, you know, forward towards the table a little bit more, a little bit conspiratorial with you. So, what do you think these ugly ne'er-do-well type of men would be doing late at night? Well, I, I have a few things in mind. 
that they could be doing, but I'm not sure. Bodum perks up. Ah, tattoos! No. It either can be women drinking, gambling, or same other mis mischievous deeds. Julius's eyes light up at the mischievous deeds section of this. And he uh, smiles for a moment and says, Well, you see, the tattoo shop is, uh, well, it's more or less a front. Our, our good master, Rubino, is um, known in these parts to be a, a minor fence and uh, in control of a group of thugs and ne'er-do-wells that enjoy robbing people near town. Are these the same as Lothar's men? No, 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 no. Lothar's men are, well, thugs, yes. But uh, Lothar's men generally come from the populace. Uh, Lothar is actually spoken of quite highly in the area. A little jumpy, a little skittish, a uh, suspicious man, yes. But for the most part, this town views uh, Lothar as a mm, benefactor. And Rubino is definitely not on his payroll. So you're saying in a small town, there's multiple bands of brigands? Well, yes. Most small towns do have their little cliques. Are they sharing a territory or the one is not aware of the other? I would say that mm, Rubino is not aware of Lothar's connections. Arcana, who's sitting next to you uh, at the table, of course, she's able to hear most of this conversation as well. She nods in agreement. But I think Arthur was the only one who would really know Arthur was uh, was Lothar's man here in town. Uh, everybody reported to him, the bandits and such. So, if Can anybody... Can I say something about Arthur? I start his body in the house, making sure oh. he stays there, not disturbed. Aha! Yes, yes you did. I That's... want to visit him tomorrow. Yes, yes, you do. You need to get some rest so that way you can uh, yes. prepare your Speak With Dead spell. Yes, and I cannot find it. That's what I was looking for. I think Speak With Dead is third level. I do believe. Let's see here. Speak with Dead is, yep, third level. And you will need to have some incense. I'm a priest. I carry such stuff. But I can always go ask for help from the local church. Well, unfortunately, there is no churches in town. Not any real church. Um, however, there is a supply right across the street, but unfortunately, it is closed for the evening. I would need it tomorrow anyway. So... If everybody would like to give me an insight check, I can give you a little more information. <clears throat> Maybe I should have said if everybody gave me a successful insight check. 
Hey, <laughs> hey, I'm busy playing a loot for the very you first didn't time. didn't specify. Come entertaining on. people. That is true. Oh, well, well, look at that. Look at Ariki. She's like, this is easy street. Well, yeah, after you tell her it has to be successful. Come on. Well, Bowden is probably um, a little distracted. We know Seraphin is definitely distracted. Yeah. So, okay. Um, so, Ariki, you will definitely be able to understand this. And, and whether it's uh, your scouting heritage or what it may be, um, you realize that there's actually a total of four power groups that are all in this same area. Uh, power group number one would be Lothar and his men. Power group number two seems to be Rabino and, and his men. Power group number three would be Sir Ovulus, the, uh, the very nice-looking man who is sitting a couple of tables away. And then power group number four would be the actual government of the area. Hey, Aglos is back. So what are you suggesting about these men at the tattoo shop? Well, I know that they're active at night. Very active at night. However, you may wish to visit them when they're a little drowsy during the day. Would a mid-morning be a good time? What do you think? I still don't understand why we'd be going to see them. Well... First, it's the public who would make the drew the tattoo, then he must have at least seen a map. And Arcana uh. is nodding her head. Because, that makes sense, yes. Yep, if Lothar is terrified of Dragon Mountain, and the tattoo you just saw was a dragon coiled around a mountain that looks like it was made from a map, then there seems to be some correlation here. Hey guys, who of you wants to go and speak to the barmaid with the curly red hair? That's up to you guys. What do you want to speak to her about? Her tattoo, of course. But we know where she got it. Yes, but she might know what it represents. But, uh, and she might have seen it somewhere. Odin looks to the bard, uh, kind of as a prompt. Oh, you would like me to call her back over? He smiles. His smile touches his face. You know he's he's a very eloquent speaker. Um, and obviously he's kind of uh, rakish when it comes to women. And he kind of had that smile touches his eyes and stuff. And it almost looks like a well-meaning leer on his face. Julius, will you be so kind to do us this little favor? Sure. Do you need her distracted? Oh, I can keep her distracted for quite some time. No, we need to know if she actually knows about what the tattoo represents. Like, if she has seen it somewhere, or she's even a member. Mm. So he'll call her back over. And... She comes over and he swirls her into his lap as as she sits down. He still has his guidance. Mm -hmm. Um. Oh, here we go. Since Aglius is here, let me go ahead and I'll share the picture that we are currently at. Um, we are currently in the uh, Twin Forks uh, Inn. We're in, we're in the tavern side of it, and we are speaking with Julius the Bard, who can't play an instrument. But Seraphin is currently playing his lute, and she's building up a sweat 
more of a sweat now than she was when she was fighting. Speaking of which, Seraphin, why don't you give me another uh, proficiency check on this one? So another uh, performance. Uh, I'll give it to you an advantage, considering uh, you've been playing for a while and you had so much magical aid earlier. Says you that I don't know how to play an instrument. You've never seen my armpit bagpipes. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so I, I love the fact that you just, uh, even with advantage, still got a seven. That's awesome. She's getting tired. Yes. And I, I wave at her. Seraphine, come on. You look tired. Join us. Take a rest. So. Okay. Yeah, I'll stop playing. Like, I'm done. <laughs> and put the loot back on this. Put the loot on the on the stool and just leave it alone. Walk away. A few people. I applause loudly. I I'm clapping for her. Okay, not a problem. So, so Blue Moon is the one who who's clapping the loudest. A few others clap. You know, yay. You know, kind of like absentmindedly clap. Some of them throw a couple of coppers on the floor in front of you as you walk. And don't pay any mind to you. But, uh, so you come back over to the table, and Julius has this red-headed barmaid in his hands. Um, and she says that she thought it was pretty. So therefore, she picked it. Um, and she had seen a picture of it on the table, on his tattoo table. And she picked it to be tattooed on her leg. Wow. <laughs> Aglius is, is, is feeling frisky today. Apparently he's going to start throwing firebolts at people. Um, the most dangerous people, Ariki, that you can see are Sir Ovulus and his men, um, at yourselves, and maybe one person in a corner, but that one who is really dangerous, quote-unquote, uh, seems to be more dangerous to his plate of potatoes than to anything living. Is he viciously stabbing the potatoes? He is. He is viciously stabbing his potatoes with his ham hock of a hand wrapped around his fork like somebody who has never used one before, and he's just stabbing at them. I mean, looking at the man, he must have ogre blood in him somewhere, because he is just a big bear of a man. But as he stabs things, the the wave that passes across his body and his blubber is is almost hypnotizing to watch. Well, I would like to just cast Detect Thoughts, and I will have a 30-feet area of ability to detect certain people's thoughts, or creatures' thoughts. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. All right, so you detect thoughts, and you will catch the surface thoughts of a great number of people. Um, the surface thoughts of Julius and this bar woman, <laughs> the red-headed bard woman, um, are X-rated, and I cannot repeat them on Twitch, or else I'll get banned. Um, <laughs> around the room, however, you are picking up little surface thoughts. I'll start with the commoners first. Um, the players will tell you what they're thinking of as they think of it. But... Uh, Around the room, you can hear various thoughts of things like uh, what the snow is going to do to the last crops that are in the field. Uh, did I, you know, did I stoke the fire enough that when I get home, my house will be warm? You know, very common, everyday kind of thoughts. Now, when you get to Sir Ovulus's table, who he is obviously a man who has religious convictions. Um, and so, and there's a priest who's sitting next to him, and all of his men who are sitting there, they're enjoying food and drink and the warmth of, of the inn. They're being loud amongst themselves, and they do not care that others around them are being disturbed by, you know, how loud they are. They're laughing and doing all sorts of, you know, carrying on crap. But... 
of all of those men who are sitting there, the priest is the one you cannot detect. He is a black hole to you. I relay this information to uh, Seraphin and Blue Moon, or whoever's closest to me in my party. Okay. And roll me an insight check as well, Aglius. Uh, in the tower, please. Okay. By the way, I had to burn a third level spell slot for that one, because I didn't have any two level. Don't worry, we are going to sleep soon. Because we have a body I want to talk to tomorrow. Okay. Um, Aglius, you also notice, after you've, you know, detected the thoughts and such, you notice that this priest is staring directly at you. Do I see him staring at our table? Um, Ariki will notice that the priest is staring at Aglius. The rest of you can roll me a perception check. Ariki is loving the fact that her passive perception is higher than most DCs in D&D. <laughs> She's got a 21 passive, so she notices stuff pretty much flat off. I don't notice anything. <laughs> Neither does Seraphin. Seraphin doesn't see anything. Blue Moon doesn't notice anything. Yeah, I'm distracted by the guy that's stopping his potatoes. You two found the full mugs of ale in front of you. So, uh, yeah, he just is staring at you, Aglius, and Ariki, you can see this as well. And at one point in time, he just looks at, I mean, as he's staring at you, he lifts a finger, kind of, not so much so like his party doesn't notice what he's doing, but he does it kind of on the down low. And he waves a finger at you like, uh, 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 and smiles and then goes back to eating. I look at Taglius. What was that for? Hmm. Taglius? I don't know. He, I'm not able to read his thoughts, but he knows I'm, that he can block me, it seems like. So, I wonder if... I wouldn't be able to cast invisibility and have him not be able to detect me at all and possibly block that. Or maybe add it at an advantage because he won't even see that I'm doing it. Why are you so worried about the religious man? He is the only one that I can't detect thoughts of out of the whole room. And something's amiss. Can you so if God has thoughts? granted him protections, what's so different about that? Maybe it's not the protection we think of. Meanwhile, the, uh, the red-haired woman gets up from the table and, and goes back to work. Um... And Julia sits there drinking a, a mug of ale, and and uh, everybody has mugs in front of them. You all have potatoes now in front of you, too. They just seem to appear while uh, you have been discussing things. Um, Arcana, she uh, starts digging into the potatoes like she has never eaten in her life. She is kind of a wafy young lady. She uh, is pretty thin. Uh, tiny, uh, a stiff breeze from the doorway would probably blow her over in her chair. I put my hand on her shoulder and said, Eat slower, dear. They won't run away. She smiles and giggles to herself for a moment. Odin will take a couple big bites and then slide his potatoes over to her. Now, the potatoes are... Probably some of the best things any of you have ever eaten. Uh, it, they're slightly spiced, uh, just right. They smell wonderful. They have just the right toothy tenderness to them. Um, they slide down easily. And 
the they seem to be perfectly paired with the ale that's at the table. Of course, Aglius has tea in front of him. Thank you. I'm looking at Julius. So, did you manage to learn anything? Well, uh, besides the barmaid's measurements. Well, her measurements, and he smiles. If you really want to know those, I could tell you those. But um, no. She picked the picture. She saw a picture on a table at the tattoo shop and said, I want that. So she doesn't know what it means. What it means is there's a map on the table. Right? That's why we have to go question the men. Probably, yes. Bowden looks around like he thinks he's pieced it together, but is trying to get recognition from other people. <laughs> yes, Bowden, you're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> I can almost see Seraphin just reaching out and patting Bowden gently on the head. <laughs> yes, yes, you're doing He's looking good. for a Scooby snack, too. Well, those potatoes are pretty Scooby snackish. To say, I mean that—that's a Scooby snack right there, and it's free, and I don't have to pay for it. So, Agnes, were you able to check what the big guy that was stabbing his potato was thinking about? He looked very angry at the potatoes. You look around, and Aglius is nowhere to be seen. Wow. We're missing a short person. Yes, yes. You gotta keep a leash on those short people. <laughs> As he uses more charges. Mwahaha. More power. Oh, I can't wait till you start, you know, soaking fireballs and stuff with it and blow up your staff. That'd nope. Be awesome. I got a strategy, sir. Okay, okay. So, alright, so, uh, Aglius, while you are invisible, um, no, uh, you still get the same thing from, you know, once again, you get everybody in the room except for the priest. And just to clarify for my player knowledge, this is the priest that, um, that old six-year-old priest yes. that wanted that horrible music? Okay. Yep, yep, that's that guy. He's sitting down near Sir Ovulus. So I want to lean over to Julius and ask him about who this priest is and how do you know him? And why does he, like, you know, enjoy horrible music. I don't know the priest. Um, I do know that he is one of Sir Obvious's men. And he points to the kind of the big roly-poly guy in the plate armor with the nice sword. Um, he is one of him. One of his men. Um, which, as he's talking about him, you look over at the table and you see that the, the priest suddenly just kind of wiggles his head and puts his finger in his ear and and it looks around like, you know, he suddenly got the, like a fly flew in his ear or something. Um, he's always with Sir Ovulus. Uh, they, they call our little town here their base of operations and kind of gives you air quotes. Their base of operations. Um, they're well-meaning bunch. And he kind of lowers his voice a little bit more. However, they have kind of an archaic sense of honor. They, um... Every slight, real or imagined, they tend to come rushing and charging in and, and try to stop. And they kind of go overboard sometimes. There must be those who protect order. Oh, they do. They protect order. They, they, they really protect order. Um, 
to the point where, well, these these folks, they're, they're good. They're good-hearted people. They just are a little zealous in their protection. As if it were a divine calling for them. Yes, well it may be. I tend to avoid those types. Says the paladin. <laughs> Personally, I just found that to yep. be hilarious. You saw his religion check. Yes. So, so meanwhile, all right, I'm going to move over to Aglius for a second. So, Aglius, you're tormenting this poor priest while you're invisible. Yep, it's chaotic for you. Okay, well, you're not going to be able to tie his shoe because he doesn't have any laces to tie. They're just basic boots that he's wearing. <laughs> I'll figure out something. You'll figure out something. Okay, so are you trying to pick a fight with him? That's I guess that's probably my best question. To an extent, because he's the only one that I can't br uh, read his mind, so I'm trying to throw him off his game. Break his concentration. Well, he's obviously not concentrating on anything. But he's also not able to be read thoughts. Right. You can. He just can't read his thoughts. And there's something wrong with that. You can roll me an Arcana check if you'd like. Oh, absolutely. Meanwhile, Bowden leans over to the chair that Aglois was last seen in and whispers. <laughs> and whispers to the air. And Alex got it right. Yes, perhaps it's a magic item, and that's exactly what Aglius will come to figure out for himself as well, is perhaps he has a magic item on his person that keeps him from being... Uh, Having his mind read. Okay. What's that in mind? Uh, Agulus walks over to Ariki and whispers in her ear saying that this is Agulus. And he senses that there's a magic item on this priest. And he's wondering if she would like to pickpocket the priest so that we can figure out what this priest has in his mind. Oh my. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. All she has if to do you, is nod her head. If you include me in this whispering, I could help out. Well, I guess this is up to Ariki, because I think the disembodied voice of the, uh, of the gnome just called her a thief. If she wanted to. She is stealthy as heck. And invisibility would only enhance that skill. So, okay. So here is... Well, invisibility doesn't really do much for stealth other than just make you invisible. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to... The, the, the situation is unusual. As all of you see, Ariki suddenly whip her head around and she stares at absolutely nothing. And she looks absolutely shocked and dismayed at the air next to her. What is it? Bowden kind of puts his hand on his warhammer. I'm guessing Alex has a little bit of uh, difficulty speaking today. Ah, the computer froze up on her. Gotcha. Okay, I'll run her character. <laughs> <laughs> so, alrighty. So, she will stare shocked there for a moment. Bowden is looking around like, what the hell's going on? Blue Moon, you're now getting very confused. Arcana is now on her third plate of potatoes. Um, and her... Uh, probably her fourth ale. Julius is beginning to check out 
both Arcana and Seraphin. Um, he looks uncomfortable when it comes to Blue Moon, and he hasn't gotten to... Who? Who looks uncomfortable looking at me? Julius. Julius actually looks a little uncomfortable around you. Like, he'll look at you, and wow. he kind of, uh, he, he kind of, like, wiggles in his chair every time he looks at you. Not like, you, you know... You got a crush. No. I'm puzzled. I'm totally puzzled. I'm, well, you know what? Uh, Blue Moon, you're allowed to go ahead and roll an insight check to see maybe you can understand why he's wiggling in his chair. And, uh, Julius has yet to actually catch Ariki's attention long enough to be able to make a determination on that. Ah, he is uncomfortable around you, and it looks like more about fear, as if he fears you. Well, why? I wonder why. So, um, and for Bowden, since Bowden has had his eyes on a very specific thing in the room since he noticed it, um, you will notice that it is beginning to glow in a soft white light. Oh shit, I forgot about it. You know what it I'm talking about, correct, Bowden? Yes. Yes, yes. And you can feel it. Matter of fact, Blue Moon, you feel... You can feel from behind you. You can, can I say something? That if it's not too late in the night, and if I'm standing in a very well lit room, it won't be really visible? Yep, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. My um, detect magic would have picked it up, wouldn't it? Well, your detect magic is a concentration, and so is your invisibility. But... Um, the question is, how well lit is the room we're in? Uh, it's... The room is a good size. I mean, it's not tiny. It's a pretty good size. And how well lit is the and, room? I know, I'm no, I'm trying to figure that out. Um, and there is quite a number of braziers hanging from the ceiling, plus the fireplace and stuff. I would say it's well lit enough that you're not really glowing yourself. But you can feel, Blue Moon, you can feel the wash of some kind of intelligence from behind you like a magical t intelligence um you feel very calm and protected by this intelligence i want to turn back and scan the crowd and check if there's someone who's watching me or trying to do something okay um the, peop the only people that who are really behind you of note um, is that table with Sir Ovulus in it. That's it. You don't is see that they're... Is he looking at me? No, no one's looking at you. Only one who... Okay. Well, I don't know who does look at you at all is Julius. And as I said, every time he looks at you, he squirms and kind of like looks away from you quickly. I didn't know that I was like, Julius, what's wrong? There is absolutely nothing wrong. Nothing at all. Really? Because you're quite shifty. You are fidgeting in your chair. Ariki, what's going on? What did you see? <laughs> I'm reading all the messages that Ariki's putting up in chat. That's funny. So, um... Julius kind of squirms a little bit, and then he kind of regains his composure. You can see he's actually forcing himself to regain his composure. And he looks across and he says, I just get a little nervous around religious types. Um, it's obvious that uh, you you have some some connection to, to, the, to the gods. And it makes me a little nervous. I, uh, I had a I had a, 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 a mistress once when I was in school. The headmistress, she was a very devout woman, and 
any time I would act up in class, she would slap my hands with a ruler. And ever since then, I have a little, uh, a little I'm get a little shy around uh, people like that. I will gently lean forward and try to very slowly put my hand all over his hand and tap him. It's like, don't worry, I'm not a very religious person. He, sh he nods his head and he smiles at you. The smile that comes to his eyes and to his, well, the smile that comes to his lips is very close to the same smile he had given the barmaid. That kind of almost that leer. It's a good natured leer. You know, it's like, you know, he's kind of flirting. But that yeah, never I'll, touches I'll his eyes. I will lean ever, even closer to his ear and I'll say, you see that guy over there, the priest one? I don't like him. He's the religious type. True. True, he is religious. But granted, Sir Ovulus and all of his men are also religious. As I said, I'm they get a little zealous. I'm particular about the priest. Mm, well, yeah, he looks that way. I don't know what's about him, but I don't like him. So as you guys are watching and paying attention to what's going on at the other table and such, the priest lifts up a, a, a glass or a cup and starts to drink it. And then it's almost as if the cup moves of its own accord and dumps down the front of him. He kind of stands up and, and stands back a little bit and he looks around and he's looking around and doesn't see anything. He looks over at your table for a moment, specifically at the empty chair where Aglius was sitting. Sir Ovulus is reaching down to that weapon on his side, and the priest raises his hand for a moment. He chants a few words. The religious types, you may roll a religion check as he chants, intones these words. He's not being quiet about it at all. Odin's not going to bother with that. He's just watching the actions of the guy with the sword. Okay. And as the priest finishes the few words, you see Aglius running out the front door of the inn. Suddenly he just appears, and he's running out the front door of the inn. The priest will then shake his head and sit back down. Sir, uh, Sir Ovulus, on the other hand, is looking around all over the place. The, the priest kind of chuckles a little bit and, and pats the large knight on the, uh, on the arm. And Sir Ovulus goes back to whatever conversation he was having with everybody. And Bowden visually relaxes a little bit more and uh, turns back to the table. So, tattoo shop in the morning then. Lady Arcana nods her head. And with a mouth full of her fifth plate of potatoes, she says, Well, certainly. Oh, come on, Arcana, you'll get sick. Stop eating. I will when I'm done with this plate. Let the woman eat. She needs to be healthy. Yes, but that doesn't mean she needs to be sick. I want to see if she's going to throw up. She's been downing all that ale. Yeah, and potatoes. So it's nothing but carbs and alcohol going into her body. Those are two negatives right there. I mean, there's no fat involved at all. This is not going to end well. No, it's not. Define oh, hurting you. Hmm? I'm just waiting for her to, like, fall off her stool from being so drunk. Just waiting <laughs> for it. Well, she's more... She is more full of potatoes than she is full of ale. So she has plenty of food in her stomach to help her out with that part. But uh, yeah, most definitely it's, uh, it's entertaining to watch her eat as this poor little girl starts packing it all away. 
But as the evening wears on, Julius says that he'll meet with all of you in the morning because he has other things to attend to as he raises his eyebrows in that kind of that lecherous way and he goes and finds the red-headed barmaid. Okay. And people I begin smile to, at him uh, and say, good luck. <laughs> he, he smiles back and says, I don't need luck. And he just kind of walks away with her. The other commoners and stuff begin to to file out. Sir Ovulus and his men begin to file out as well. Um, so it's all basically fine. Okay, so Aglius, you have detect magic back on. And what are you attempting to detect? Um, where this magical item might be on the priest and that uh, glowing light that was potentially noticed by me. The glowing light was not noticed by you at all. But you will see that the sword and the armor of Sir Ovulus are both incredibly magical. The priest has absolutely no magic on him whatsoever. And a few of his men also have some magical items here and there. Mostly weapons or armor. If the priest doesn't have a magical item on him, none. Um, talk about I can read, read everybody else's thoughts, but his. You cannot read his thoughts. Would you attempt? Would like to attempt a Arcana check before the priest leaves for the evening? Absolutely. Okay, you can roll it in the tower again. I don't know whether it was the first time, but okay, I'll do it. Did you get it? Oh yeah, I got it. Doesn't sound good. Yeah, that, see, I just showed you what it was. An eight. So that means you rolled a one. <laughs> um, you have no idea what would be going on here. He is a mystery to you. Yeah, I'm still chuckling after getting them with the mug. But uh, he and all of uh, Sir Ovulus's men leave. And the barkeep and his wife are beginning to pack things up for the night and have given you all your keys. Okay, I'm heading to my room. Yeah, Bowden heads straight up as well. All right. So what I shall do is I'll give everybody a long rest. Anybody want to do anything before I give the long rest out? Um, does the long rest uh, also give back uh, health? Uh, it will heal you 100%, yes. Does anybody have any like rings of store magic or anything like that? Nope. Is what it's been stolen from me, and I am definitely going to get it back. So, speaking of magic items, the next day, <laughs> I was like, the next day, all right. So, you get what is it, 21 back? Yes, sir. So, that is, I do believe, all of them for you. I think they're done in uh, groups of 10. Yes, they are. All right, so that is taken care of. Now, let me see if there's anything. That, does anybody have any effects they need to take off themselves right now, or are we good? I did my spells for the morning, so I'm fine. Okay, very good. I'm good. Awesome. All right. So we will move on to the next morning. Wow, that was interesting. Robo Lady, run. Not only yeah, that... are, are you roboting, you're roboting in slow motion. There we go. 
So that is what Twin Forks looks like in the morning for you. Outside. Yes, she's being assimilated, says my chat. Um, I'm going to assume that you guys want to head to go see Arthur first. Is that correct? Well, I think we should find Julius again. Make sure uh, he's with us. <laughs> wow. Now it's musical. Uh, uh, um, I think, Alex, we're going to have to have you type in the uh, Fantasy Grounds chat. So that way we can all read that because you're so slow and robotting so hard can't even pretend to understand what you're saying. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, all right. So you guys want to find Julius first. All right. So Julius is easy enough to find in the morning. Very, very easy to find. He comes down the stairs and, and you see that he uh, has... Uh, Probably had a very long evening. He looks like he's been awake for far longer than he should have or didn't get anywhere close to the amount of sleep he should have. He yawns and stretches as he as he approaches all of you. Good morrow. And he... Good morning. And he gives you a low bow to the ladies and, 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 and shakes Bowden's hand and... And kind of like high fives Aglius, considering he just doesn't want to bend over again. So where are we off to as he stretches? To the tattoo shop that you were telling us about. Did you guys want to go to the tattoo shop first? Or did you want to talk to Arthur first? We want to go to Arthur first, and then to the shop. Oh, oh, okay, sure. Yes, she's got she's got an appointment with a dead guy. Yes, my lovely specialty. Okay, so you will go back to Lothar's house. Um, you will notice that the house does not look disturbed at all. Okay. Um, the house has not been disturbed since you guys last were here. All the bodies are exactly where they were left before. No, they have not turned into zombies that will jump up and eat your face. So you're lucky there. But uh, you are able, since you kind of set Arthur's body aside from the rest of them, you are able to get back to Arthur's body, which is inside the building, and you are able to cast Speak With Dead on him. Was there really anything left after all the damage we did? What? To the house? No, the house didn't have much damage done to it at all. No, to Arthur. To Arthur? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Arthur has enough left that he's able to do a... You guys can do a speak with dead. He's okay, got he a got head. That's up. all he needs, really. I think. Just the head. Just the head, yeah. That's not weird at all. Yeah, not weird at all. All right, so... Have the five of you discussed what you want to ask Arthur, or is Blue Moon just going to go shoot from the hip on this? Well, Bowden makes it clear that they just need to find Lothar. Okay. Well, we should ask him what other information he uh, would like that he thinks would be beneficial to us, and also um, how he would like his remains treated, um, anything he'd like to tell any last family members, and what he'd like on his tombstone. That's a lot. I would like to keep it more simple. Where was the last time you seen Lothar? Who are the other known associates, and where are they, and where can we find them? Okay. All right. That works. All right. So now it is up to Blue Moon to ask the questions. Okay, I'm casting Speak with the Dead. Okay. Now, if I remember correctly, with Speak with Dead, 
think it's three questions. I think it was five. Oh, you're right. Five questions. You can ask up to five questions. Oh, I was just remembering uh, the incense. Did we need to go pick that up from the store? Unless she has some on her, she definitely needs to have some incense. She doesn't have a component pouch? Yeah, I do have a component pouch. I was like, I'm going to be a cleric. Ah, I do not see a component pouch on you. Really? I forgot to add it. Actually, I don't know how to add it. Most clerics don't typically use them. They uh, usually use just a holy symbol to cast all of their spells. But in this case, incense is very important, which is cheap. Incense is like a couple of copper pieces. Okay, so I then... guess you have to do one pit stop before we... Uh... Shake down yeah, before we go to speak with Arthur. Okay, not a problem. So the, the supply shop is right across the street. It's really not a very difficult place to go to. You do find some incense, which is kind of surprising considering it's a small town little supply store. You find incense. Um, it only does cost a couple of copper. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the, the, the coinage that was thrown at Seraphin last night could pretty much pay for this stuff. And then the incense laughs and attempts to bite uh, Seraphin right in the nose. What? what? I didn't touch the incense. <laughs> well, it wants to touch you. Creepy. I'm kidding. I'm, kidding. I'm going, you know, with the whole chat thing with the idea that they're redeeming. They mimics. want their mimic. Yeah. 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 I mean, if that would be like the saddest and like mimic ever to yeah. choose incense. Can I buy a company? I mean, bro? just grab it and burn it. You want a component pouch? I think those are... I don't remember how much they are. They're in the player's handbook. Well, I have like 10 gold. Find a relic or a component pouch. Healer's kit? Yeah, you can get healer's kits and stuff here too. Healer's kit doesn't have incense in it though. So... If anybody needs to bar purchase anything, you can purchase pretty much anything you find in the player's handbook. Um, you can purchase from the supply store. Uh, the component pouch is going to be 25 gold. Really? Yeah, it's a little expensive. But don't forget, you guys did find 250 gold on the people. Oh, did we split the gold? Not yet. I have not yet. Here, let me go ahead and split that out for you. There you go. Everybody gets 50 gold. Thank you. I would like to buy a component pouch. Okay. Uh, be sure to keep track of your own money and stuff on how you spend them. And you can pull yeah, the I'm reducing right them. Out. You said 25 gold? Yep. Okay. I'm poor again. Awesome. Alrighty. So if you have all finished your shopping. I mean, you can always finish I your shopping while we're doing the talk and we'll speak with Dad. I'm sorry, go ahead. I have to add it. I just don't know where to look for it. Okay, I can help you grab it here. Give me one moment. Let me see here, component pouch. I found it. Oh, you found it? Okay. While they're all doing that, Agula stayed behind in that area where Arthur was and just sat in the corner smoking his pipe and playing with his dragon toy. Can somebody tell me how much costs a healer kit? Healer kits are... I just five. Have... Five, thank you. Okay, I'll buy one of these two. Okay. Alrighty. So, if anybody else has anything they want to get, as I was going to say earlier, um, you guys can go ahead and just pull it out of the player's handbook while, uh, 
were asking Arthur's body questions because I only got about 15 more minutes that I can run so before I have to start bringing people to the doctor. Okay, let's wrap up the questions, the five questions. Yep, that way we can actually do the tattoo shop at the beginning of next game session. Okay, sounds good. So you get back over to Lothar's house. Arthur's body is being guarded by Aglius. And you start burning your incense, cast your spell. You have five I'm questions. I'm discussing the questions again. Yeah, the, I think the first one should be if we directly ask him if he knows where Lothar is or have gone. No. No, I'm discussing this with the group before I ask him. Well, I don't think that's a great idea. Wait, 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 but um, didn't you do that death vision thing where you saw the last moments of his life and he didn't know where he was? He was mad that, you know, he felt abandoned. Yeah. Odin saw that. Okay, so, so we, we can assume that he doesn't know where he's at. Down. Okay, so he doesn't know where he has gone. Right. But we need to know where he was seen last. Maybe we can backtrack and kind of go from there. And then asking about other, you know, I guess, big associates of his organization. Maybe they might have some knowledge. Or other towns oh, that's he a good out too. Alex just uh, mentioned in chat about where Lothar tends to hole up. I guess other safe houses would be a good thing, too. Well, that's generally three questions so far, so we have two more. You may want to save some of your questions as follow-ups. True. Okay. Then I'll start asking him questions. Okay, so go ahead. You start asking me the questions and he will respond. Hello, Arthur. Do you know where Lothar has been seen last? He was seen here in town. Do you know who's he others uh, he, who's he other associates were? In town, his associates were myself and my men. Oh, that was tricky. Do you know the location of the other safe houses he has? Yes. That's just mean. It is. But I mean, it does, he doesn't have to be forthcoming with information. Yeah, let me, let me read this questions. line. Let me read this line to you in the Speak with Dead before you ask your last two spells. Answers are usually brief, cryptic, or repetitive, and the corpse is under no compulsion to offer a truthful answer if you are hostile to it or it recognizes you as an enemy. Considering you guys are the ones who killed him, you would be considered enemies. <laughs> Maybe we should have left the room. I mean, technically, Blue Moon didn't kill him. Nope, you did. So that's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm still, believe it or not, though, I'm still actually answering these all truthfully, though. So. Um. Maybe ask where the locate, not if he knows, but to tell us the locations of these safe houses. Tell us the locations of the other safe houses. He has one in Waterdeep. He has one in uh, Twin Forks. He has one in uh, Harker's Ferry. 
He has one here. He has one there. He has one over 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 there. And he keeps on going and saying this over and over again. Let's just ask him, where does he typically stay exactly? Where he typically stays? His favorite hideout. One that he holds like... Do you know his um, favorite hideout? Yes. Oh, God. His favorite hideout... Here, I'll give you a little bit more than that. That was was really mean of me. His favorite hideout is here. Really? This place is such a dump. And at this point, Blue Moon, you know... I have one... Oh, you I have, have one, one more question? Yes. Okay. Do you know why he was afraid of the red dragon's tattoo or its associ- associates? Dragon Mountain? Yeah, the Dragon Mountain. Dragon Mountain is a terrible place. Yeah. Tell us more about it and why he was afraid of it. It's a terrible place. It's It's... He he would speak of it. He was terrified by it. And then the spirit goes toodles and poops. Goes and pops back out of the body. Now can we burn the house down? You just want to burn things down, don't you? I don't think we should burn the house down. Well, it would take care of all the dead bodies. That's true. Or we can burn the dead bodies and keep the house. Eh, People might wonder why dead bodies are burning. Now, if the house burns down and there's dead bodies in the house, people will think they died in the fire. Tomatoes, tomatoes. And this house is pretty crappy anyways. I mean, look at this. It's so unkept. It's dirty. Probably got bad electrical. Not the code. <laughs> wow. Wow. You know, if I mean, anything, guy... they'd be earning insurance money. Yeah, yep. exactly. I mean, I mean the guy leak. obviously couldn't keep a house to save his life. I mean, he he was not the housekeeping type. So, all right. Well, with that and the contemplation of burning down the house... <laughs> I will give you all your experience points. Don't forget to add another loot point to yourselves since you all showed up today. You all get a loot point. You have actually done quite a bit of stuff. (laughs) GPS coordinates within 10 miles. (laughs) And you have found out a lot of information. So. I'm wondering whether to burn one more third level spell to ask him five more questions. But I'm not sure that's wise. Well, you can think about that for next game session. How's that sound? Okay. Guys, you also have to think about it. Yep. And that, see, look, now you have an entire week to come up with what questions you want to ask. It's not going to be enough time. <laughs> we'll have a it's long like, list. It's like getting a ring of wishes. You know, you sit there like, all right, now we got to spend like five days working on this wish and wording it just right. So, uh, all right. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are cutting it short today because I have to bring people to the doctor's office because we may have the flu running through my house. Yay. Um, Yay. Yeah. I'll be back this evening at 8 p.m. to play, uh, what is it, White Plume Mountain, which should be the last episode of White Plume Mountain this evening uh, with myself and Susie Q if she's feeling up to it because she is one of the sick people today. So, uh, and our rule in our house is no gaming if you don't go to school or work. And in her case, she did not go to work today, so therefore she's probably not going to be gaming this evening. But of course, she is my wife, and she will browbeat me because I am a battered husband, and uh, she will beat me up and, and if I take away her gaming. So, uh, for myself, for Suzy Q, for all of my players here today, I'd like to thank everybody for coming by and watching. And I'd like to thank all those who are our new followers. Thank you very much for that. Um, And we shall see you this evening. Have a good night, everybody. Or day. Whatever it is. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.